Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you like these videos, you can support by subscribing at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M substack.com. Or becoming a patron at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash tawahado. And make sure if you're seeing this on YouTube that you like, comment, and subscribe. Today, I am joined by my beloved brother, Professor Mahari in Devon. No, no. <laughs> exactly, Miss Good. And now, Tamari, and okay. Student Mahari, you tell me, Shalinyal. You know, we both, we both like languages. And uh, we've both uh, delved deep into a number of, of Semitic languages. One of the the funny things about the name Mahari is when you look at it in the English language, it's less clear. But when you look at it in Gez, depending on how it is spelled, it could mean one to whom mercy was done or one who has been uh, taught. Wh which one were you named after or were you named after both? <laughs> my mom, no, my, I think my mom named me after the mercy. Yeah, because she she was sick uh, when she uh, gave birth to me. She she got sick, and <clears throat> but later she was able to recover. So she said, "I have seen the mercy of God." So I'm gonna name this little boy, this little chubby boy. I was very chubby, even chubby. Really? Than you. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! Without the benefit of McDonald's. <laughs> No, I think my mom ate a lot of mangoes and bananas, I think. <laughs> so I was chubby and she said, okay, I'm going to name this chubby boy Mahari. So I was going to say she sounds say like, she a, like, like an ascetic, the ascetics who would eat just fruits and berries. <laughs> and I'm not sure how she managed during uh, when, when she was uh, um, pregnant with me, but I have seen her when my brother was uh, in her belly. I remember how many kilos of mangoes and bananas and <laughs> fruits she will just devour. <laughs> we still we still laugh about it whenever we mention like, "Mom, do you remember how many mangoes and bananas do you <laughs> you used to eat?" <laughs> yeah, I've 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 heard uh, different pregnant women crave uh, different things. I think. My my own mother had more of a, a craving for that southern Ethiopian uh, cuisine, particularly the uh, the various raw and rare forms of meat. When oh, yeah. uh, when when uh, <laughs> when I was in the in the womb, <laughs> that's why you are chubby. Yeah, <laughs> or you strong. Still chubby though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I I want to get into a paper that you recently um, worked on, but. Before we get into that, and we can delve deeper into it on, on many other occasions, but just could you give us a brief glance at what your academic background and, and church background has, has been to date that would contextualize you know, how you get into a topic rather than just jumping into the topic? <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I have been a deacon now, how many years? Ooh. Somewhere around two decades. So, <laughs> uh, in the Ethiopian church. And that has been the greatest blessing of my life. Uh, and after I, like, and because I lived in the church, like the, the more you live, the more you fall in love with it. That's the thing. And, and because I um, spent most of my youth in the Ethiopian church, I fell in love, I, I think I can say, I fell in love with the history of like the church, like the, the church worldwide, the, the universal church. And the more I read about it, the more I learn about it, there is always something more to learn. <laughs> Like you, you never quench this thing. I, as far as I, I, I am concerned, uh, that's what I can say. It's impossible to quench this thing because there is a lot to learn. 
and particularly to situate the the, church, the, uh, the history of the Ethiopian church in, in the history of the universal church, and like the bigger church. Uh, <clears throat> so this is how my uh, interest in church history and church fathers and uh, the history of uh, Christianity in the world began because of my the life that has uh, which I have been given in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. <clears throat> the Ethiopian Church uh, really, I can say, saved my life. Uh, because mm -hmm. I, I come from the Sabatenya. I don't know if you know Sabatenya, but Sabatenya is, no, is no. that's not, yeah, it's, it's, uh, is that, one the name of the, of, is that a name of a area where you grew up? Yes. It's right in the middle of Addis. It's called Mercato. It's, it, that's, it's, uh, it's, um, another name. And it is a Merc great place. Mercato, there, are, there are very great, like, there are very, um, the people there are, wonderful people are like we have so many great people loving and caring people however the place is not uh where children are supposed to grow it's it was uh it really was a difficult place to grow for a child but <clears throat> thanks to the church and thanks to the the, the discipline the discipline of my mom and my dad <laughs> especially my mom she was very strict with us so <clears throat> and they, they were strong churchgoers absolutely absolutely like at the, i know my parents praying i, I can say that like the, the first songs i have heard are from my mother's like lips and she has a beautiful voice and my my dad is also he, he said like he lived most of his uh, youth in the church he was he's married Marigita. He's, he's a well uh, church educated, ecclesiastically educated person. So I know my parents as praying people, and uh, they gave us the faith. They handed us they handed to us the faith of the apostolic church, the faith of like this apostolic Christianity, which emphasizes on generosity and prayer. And uh, also the love of the love for the scriptures. I remember my mom reading the Bible when I was a, a little child. So that's where, like, that's the familial base. But when I was when I became a teenager, I started going to the church and. Uh, that really saved my teenage crazy years, which would have been crazy if uh, it was not if I was I didn't go to the church and the church harnessed it in a in a positive way. Uh, it would have been, uh, yeah, because everything that can um, destroy a young person's life was around the neighborhood: alcohol, drug. Um, prostitution and all that but <clears throat> so that's why i say the church saved me because i went to the church I, my life became disciplined and yeah so it's the church gave me life i can say like, even yeah uh, and for those for those who don't catch it as a brief aside you're referring to having in your household read and studied the word of God in Amharic, which would have been yes. a relatively new tradition, seeing as, you know, there are talks of a translation in the 1800s, but for all intents and purposes, for mass usage, you don't really get it until the mid 20th century by proclamation of the king. Uh, I know this because I have myself a, a copy of the Bible from, from my grandfather, who is a, a deacon, who wanted to read in the vernacular and didn't have it available to him uh, in, in his time. And so he had to purchase an Amharic Bible from the Lutherans, who happened to have a, a translation in the early 20th century. And uh, yet the tradition of, of learning how to read and write involves reading uh, the Johnine Epistle, the, the Johnine Gospel, and the Psalms of David, it just happened to be in Giz and probably not doing a study of the terms inside, but just focusing on the, the correct pronunciation. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and and melody. So what you're talking about is a little more unique and and kind of a a newer tradition of the a latter the latter half of the of the twentieth century. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, as far as I remember, at least there were three or four Bibles in the house. <laughs> it's very interesting. One was. Uh, uh, the New Testament and the Psalms. And that particular Bible, I remember it was green and like the cover was green. My mom used to, like, like, she, she loved that Bible very much. And she, she prayed those psalms, like the Psalms from that Bible. Mm. And the Psalms, it was uh, Giz and Amharic side by side. Wow. It was a be- it's a, it was a beautiful book. It's I, I still remember how beautiful that that printing was. Uh, the other one was Amharic Bible, the Haile Selassie translation. It is that it was that one, and the third one was Machafa Kulkulu, Afanoromo. Both uh, like the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, or like the whole Scripture in Afanoromo was in our house. Mekneatum, uh, because my mom uh, uh, comes, uh, I really don't like ethnic politics, so I don't want <laughs> lab- to put these labels of uh, ethnic groups on my family. But um, my mom comes from a Fano Romo speaking family and also Gurage speaking family. I like how you put that. He said speaking. Yes. Because, like, look at the history of Ethiopia. Everybody is mixed with everyone. No one can really tell, like, oh, my yeah. ancestry is, comes from particularly this branch. Like, come on, ridiculous. Just look at and, the history of the country. Notably, when you say Machafa Kulkulu, I, I imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about the one translated by Onusimus Nasibu using the yes. alphabet. Uh, yes. and the Oromo language, rather than Absolutely. later yes. versions written in the, the so-called Kube, which is the Latin script. No, the, the Kube came very, very, very late. Like, uh, uh, I, I really, I, I don't even know um, when, when was the first uh, Kube Bible published. I don't know. But the, the Bible I, uh, I knew was nothing, I, like, I don't... Uh, I'm not making a political statement for people who are listening to this. Like, if people want to use Kube, it's up to them. It's it's this is it shouldn't be politicized. I'm just doing what I had. Like, I, it was a fan Oromo Bible, and it was written written using the Ethiopic script. And your mom understood it. It wasn't Absolutely. like she casually knew it. She she knew. No it. no no no. She she knows a fan Oromo perfectly well. Like that's where, that, that's the culture uh, she grew up in. So, she, her, her life history, like my parents' life history, is is, 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 a, is phenomenal. It's typically an Ethiopian, uh, yeah, a, a representation of how the Ethiopian life is. Like very much mixed very much of like all over the place from north to south, south to north, east to west. Like my mom was all over the place. My dad, the same thing. And I was born in Deborah's eighth, Bishof too, and I grew up in Paris. <laughs> I, was, so, I was gonna say, was gonna like, say Deborah's eighth has also become for the So yeah, I'm, I'm glad yeah, you like said Bishof too. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, it is a pity, honestly, if you ask me, like it's a pity, like we have to politicize everything. It's a pity. Um, we have, I think, f- how this is how I see it, because I I had the chance to live with my uh, grandmother, who whose native tongue is Afanoromo, and she she also she was able to communicate using Amharic without that much of a problem. She was able to read and write. Uh, at the primary level. Tico, tico. Tico, tico, yes. Tico, tico, And, but she lived with everyone in peace. She, like, the, the, the generosity of her spirit. 
attracts everyone around her, whether you are a Muslim or a Christian or a non-believer or an atheist, it doesn't matter. If you meet my, like, had you met my grandmother, you would really like to spend some time with her. Like she will, it doesn't matter if she, she will ask you your name and when she gets your name, she will invite you for, for her coffee ceremony, <laughs> which happens three times a day. <laughs> like oh, wow. She, <laughs> oh, yeah. She, she was a coffee addict. <laughs> like She says, like, well, you can take your injera and what if you like, just give me my coffee <laughs> and that will be fine. <laughs> so that's, that's how much she loved coffee. But to her coffee, to her coffee table, everyone is invited. Everyone is welcomed. If you are hungry, if she has something, if you if she has, if there is one injera in the house, trust me, I am not exaggerating when I tell you this. If there is one injera in the house, <laughs> she will she, she will put half of the injera into your on your plate and give you give it to you like as a lunch or something. Then she will reserve the, the, the other half for the children, for the kids to come or for somebody like in the family who will be hungry later. This is how generous she was. Sometimes a little too much, but she, she was a very generous person. So I think we have failed, like the new generation, we have failed from this uh, tower of uh, humanity into seeing one another in economic and political terms. See, the way she saw people is through fraternal eyes. Everybody is her brother or sister. He's a human being, he's a brother, he's, she's a sister. That's how she sees them. There is no political economic relationship between like, no, that's not what, how she sees you. It's fraternity, it's not federalism, it's fraternity. For goodness, it's fraternity. And I do believe that, I strongly believe that that was the spirit the Ethiopian society was built on. Fraternity based on fear of God. It doesn't matter what, like which religion you belong to, but you are supposed to fear the Lord. Whether you call him Waka, whether you call him Allah, whether you call him Xavier, it doesn't matter. But you know that life is a gift to you from this Waqa, this Allah, this Xavier. And you are supposed to avoid gif. You are supposed to avoid uh, unfraternal activities, unfraternal um, relationships. You, like, you have to avoid gif and tur. These, these two words are very, very important. So I think this was the core. Like God and the fear of the Lord was the core uh, value which enabled all these diverse ethnic groups to come together and to live together, to trade with one another for years and centuries and generations. I think now because we are our educate probably because our education system has been uh, bereft of God for the last. Uh, probably 50. 60, 70, yeah, 50 years. Like the, edu the education system, have, 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 it has become bereft of God, like God is absent. And that absence of God, I think, has um, made the generation uh, to lack that mentality or that perspective of seeing one another without political economic narratives. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we have failed from, yeah, we have, we have failed. And I think we, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to that, like beyond federal, we have to think beyond federalism and uh, unitarianism or whatever, but just fraternity. I think that will, that will help us a, a great deal, I believe. So yeah, yeah. I've, How did I've, I reach I've, here? <laughs> I've, <laughs> Sorry, I've heard you. No, that's good. It's good. I, I've heard you refer to the, and it's important to note, by the way, it's the communists who, of course, 
removed that God first. And, uh, you know, again, if people want to take that as politics, those are facts. That's, that's the beginning of it, the unraveling to the current day. Um, and interestingly enough, it wasn't until the current prime minister a couple of years ago till the people actually heard the word God. I remember some of the bishops of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in their 80s, I saw them crying when they heard it. And it's such a simple thing, you know, he could be real, he could be inauthentic. We don't know, you know, we don't know the truth until until the last days, you know, until his chronicle is written and all that. But I just saw them crying because they literally hadn't heard a government official even utter the name. It was... It was, uh, you know, express hatred towards God for a certain period. But then another period after that, it was just uh, play the avoidance game, just uh, out of sight, out of mind, try to not mention him. Of course, um, the unifying kind of narrative was an official church and state. It was an absolute monarch. It was uh, the Orthodox Church. And that's troubling for some people. And and undeniably, there were uh, abuses and, and violations, but there was this kind of fraternity you're talking about. I've heard you speak before about how, I think this is connected, the society itself was a church rather than looking at a, a church building, but looking at the society itself as the, the temple of the Lord. Can you uh, briefly talk about that before we actually get into the meat of your paper? Okay, sure. <laughs> Digressions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you see, from the from the the, the, the Christian from a Christian perspective, the church is not um, a Bible study group. Okay, uh, this is not apostolic. This is not the apostolic tradition. The church is not a Bible study group. It's not. Um, a store for sacraments like where you go and get some sacraments to get to to heaven or something like no that, that's not what the church is according to the, the apostolic tradition the church is a eucharistic community it's a community gathered around the eucharist and the eucharist is it's eucharisto right it's the greek word the eucharisto like it's praise it's akotet you see, it's accoted. It's accoted to the Lord. It's good words and praise and thanksgiving to the Lord for the one gift that has been given. And the one gift that has been given to the world is God himself. That's the beauty of it. God himself. God himself gave us in his word, in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. He, he, he dwelt among us and then he gave us the Holy Eucharist, his body and blood. And he said, do this in memory of me. So we gather around that. We gather around him, around Jesus. And we praise him for that gift. Because he has given us himself to make us one into himself. So we praise him for that. And after that, after the uh, after that Eucharistic gathering, then we go out into the world to bring the world back to that communion. So everything we do is liturgical. Everything we do is oriented to that point which we came from and which we are going back. Everything is worship. Everything is praise. Everything is liturgy for us. When you live, like one lives in this way, as um, Father Mevratu Kiro, uh, the Mevratu Gabru, sorry, uh, the, he puts it in his uh, this beautiful dissertation, uh, how the whole universe, the whole cosmos, becomes a temple for the praise of the Lord. So. The Ethiopian church, I, I can't, uh, I, 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 I'm talking about the Ethiopian church because I'm, I'm yet to learn a bit of, a lot about the other religious traditions, like the, the other religions um, the, in Ethiopia. So I can't say much about the other religions, but I'm saying this from the Ethiopia, like what, how I, uh, perceive the mentality of the Ethiopian church has 
constructed the society. Okay, the way the Ethiopian Church sees itself or sees how humanities are supposed humanity is supposed to be related um, has constructed the society. So that's where uh, I'm uh, focusing on. I'm not denying the existence of the other religions. I'm not denying that the other religions have nothing to to contribute, nothing to do. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm I just I'm just not qualified to comment on that. That's that's the whole point. So, but from the church's perspective, this is how humanity is supported, related in God. Humanity is related in God, not in the city, not in the city state, not in political economy, but in God. It's only God who makes us one. And because we are united in Him, because we are supposed to be united in Him, everything we after the, that gathering, after the Eucharistic gathering, we go out to bring everyone back to that union. And when we, we live in this way, everything becomes liturgical. And so when you count days, God is there. Today is Ledeta, tomorrow is Ba'ata, after that is Johan, that after that is Kedus Marcos, after that is Kedus Mikael. God is there in the Ethiopian society when you count, like beginning from how you count days. God is there when you open your buha, your your uh, buckets and your masobs and you when you break the bread and when you even prepare the food. God, the, the name of the Lord is called. He's omnipresent. omnipresent. Yes, he's omnipresent, and you like it's not like it's not like the Western idea of uh, sorry, I'm not um, being harsh to my Western brothers and sisters, but. It's not like, yeah, God is omnipresent. You have this and just you live your life as if you are the only one who exists. <laughs> no, that's not how it is. Like, you rec like in the, the, the way I see it, the Ethiopian society, especially the Christian society, is supposed to recognize, it, it, we are made to recognize the presence of God everywhere including when you open the mesob to get injera to prepare your food. Like you don't simply open the mesob and just grab the, the, the injera and go back. No, you, you don't do that. When you open, you say, When our mothers make the dough for injera, they, they say, as soon as they open the buhaka, they say, before they put their hands in. <laughs> they invoke the Trinity. Exactly, they invoke the Trinity. They invoke like God is everywhere. And because you consider this, this this presence, nothing really belongs to you. Because everything belongs to the one who, who brought it into existence. Like nothing is ours. So St. John Chrysostom, one of my heroes, he says, <laughs> the root of all evil is the word mine. <laughs> the word mine. Uh, and he has, he has a point. He has a point. Because political economy is all about mine. I don't know, me, me, mine. I mean, that's how uh, that's how Caesar's system or the empires or city state city the, the so-called city is built. It's Babel. It's Babylon, uh, which which is built on human pride and which reduces, unfortunately, human human beings into machines or producers and and consumers instead of uh, loving beings and existing beings who have been given existence from the existing one. It, so our forefathers, I do believe that, have brought uh, the, Eucharist li the Eucharistic life into the society and they crucified the society and made the society a church. So when you live in the society, you live in the presence of God. 
you rec like you live in con constant and continuous recognition of the presence of God. And that refrains one from gift, refrains one from abusing the other, from disregarding the dignity and the natural um, glory and gift from the Lord to that person. So, yeah, I, 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 I really strongly believe that the Ethiopian society have been made into a church. It's not just a church living in the society. No, the church has churchified the society. <laughs> Probably people living in Ethiopia might not see this because I was not able to see this living in Ethiopia. I lived in Ethiopia most of my life, but I, I was not able to see this. I only understood what it means to be an unchurched society after coming to the US, like what a secular society looks like. It's like, wow. And that's funny because a lot of people call it a Christian nation. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the only thing I can say. Like Christian nation. Well, but I would I would invite them to look uh, to look in uh, deeper into what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is not a, a, a mental ascent. It's not just a mental ascent. A, a, a mental consent, giving your mental uh, consent to some theoretical ideas. No. No, if you want, Christianity is not a religion. <laughs> Following the Father Alexander Schmemann, the great Alexander Schmemann, I, I, can, I can firmly say this. Christianity is the end of all religion. It's not a religion because it's not a quest for God. It's not a quest for God. No, it's a quest of God to man. God quests for man. That, that it's the the direction is the reverse. It's not man seeking God in his intellect and uh, desire. There is nothing wrong with that. That's great, but the human mind and the human um, uh, capacities always will be limited. It's, it will always be limited, and you we will never know God by our own reason and sense and whatever we have so yeah so <laughs> all these, I, all these digressions. <laughs> no i and i knew you're gonna say that what appear to be digressions for other people if uh you know i i don't think i'm smart in the ways that people think that i'm smart but the way in which i do think i'm smart is that I'm able to systematize the disparate, that which seem like digressions. This is actually very connected. So your critique here reminds me of what I've gotten as a sense from you. And uh, we've definitely discussed this off camera before in different ways, but I think it would be useful for the audience. So the founding of the United States is the founding of low church congregationalists in rebellion of the Church of England, which is itself a uh, high church amongst Protestants, but something that had been severed from the Latin church and from the Greek church and from the Afro-Asiatic and the East Syriac church uh, because of one adulterous uh, king, Henry VIII. Um, and so it's like a rebellion rooted in another rebellion that forms this. And what I bring that up to say in the milieu is that in the milieu, it seems, and, and you can get as uh, vague or specific as you want here, uh, it seems as if you have a, less of an ecumenical point of view towards those links towards the Christian religion which founded the United States, but kind of a grander view outside of this Church of Ethiopia we've been we've been talking about, uh, maybe one of the examples of which is like a previous guest, Deacon Dawit, 
you are a student at the uh, the Catholic Good. University of America. So maybe you could tell us just, you know, uh, what what you think of, for example, you know, the the Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the uh, the so called uh, the Church of the East. You know, our our communion, right? The Afro Asiatic uh, Orthodox communion, and anyone who's been listening to you so far must know that you are a theologian. And yet what I understood you were studying there were a bunch of different languages. I know you've been, you already knew Amharic is an English. You've been studying uh, to an extent and you can say to what extent, but you've at least been dabbling in Coptic, Arabic, Syriac, Hebrew, and Greek. And <laughs> so that that's, give us, give us a picture of that because that sounds like the whole church to me. <laughs> exactly that's that's the beauty of it and i'm yet to learn uh, latin and uh, hopefully i'll i'll keep learning all these languages because um you know there there is this thing called the danger of uh, uh, a single narrative did i say it correctly the, the danger of single story yeah the danger of single story uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, the church, one of the sins of humanity that's, uh, that uh, troubles the church like throughout history is schisms. And schisms are not, um, often they are referred as, oh, it began at this particular point. Then, oh, it began at this particular point, like the, the, the so-called the, the 1050, um, four great like the so-called great schism between the latins and the greeks or the 451 between the uh, alexandrians and uh, the antiochians and well probably alexandrians and everyone everybody else <laughs> uh, because i'm saying this because the ethiopian church that's a that's a different matter and i don't want to delve into that for like now we will come to that later. Um, so these schisms, however, did not begin or end at that particular point, at that particular era. Like the the the, the so-called another schism also the uh, four thirty uh, four thirty one, like the so-called the Church of the East and the rest of the world. Like it it just didn't happen that way. These councils happened, these, these incidents, they, like this time referred to incidents that have, that have been pointed as, oh, that's where it started. But honestly, these points were only manifestations of, uh, manifestations of what was building up to that point. And when we look at the history of the churches, the schism never, gets complete uh, completed until later time uh, to understand all what i am saying like i can give you the whole church history <laughs> here in, in you know just one podcast like that that's that's a difficult matter i, I can give two quick examples to bolster your <laughs> argument that you said it's not completed till a long time i would say it's still not complete in 20 20, the <laughs> Roman Catholic Church recognizes Gregory of Narek, an Armenian, in the Afro-Asiatic communion. In our communion, which has not been in communion with Rome since the date of 451 that you're talking about, and yet he is the figure centuries after that date. In 2020, there is yes. a book or a scroll called the Book or the Scroll of the Monks in the Ethiopian church in the Afro-Asiatic communion, two of the three authors are of the East Syriac Rite or <laughs> the Church of the East. And especially one of the figures, I don't know about the other figure, one of the figures is like 400 years after uh, the Council of Ephesus, which uh, would have been in the 430s that you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. one of the alleged splits. And so all these monks and all of the people who are students of the, the Aksumite school of interpretation 
uh, anyone who wants to be called Likahruyan, chief amongst the elect, by, by mastering the book of the monastics, 66.6 repeating percent of his teaching will be uh, allegedly Nestorian. <laughs> Interestingly, like the, 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 uh, when we come to the history, when we look at the history of the Ethiopian Church, which actually is the the focus of this paper, it, it's not it's not even a kind of an in depth analysis. It's just a reflection of what the sources are indicating. It's like we can we can delve into this uh, in in great detail, and that will be uh, like. That can be a, a, a coursework, honestly. It can be a, a semester course. Uh, what we see is, for instance, Theodore of Mopsuestia. Theodore of Mopsuestia was uh, and after the Council of Ephesus. Like this is one of the the exegetes. The, the, in the Syriac tradition, especially the East, uh, the East Syrian Church, Mpashukana, that's how they call him, the, the Mpashukana. Mpashukana is the, the, the exegete. That's how they call him. His, his works were, uh, because he's considered as the teacher of Nestorius, his, his writings were avoided, or his, his, writings, his writings were shunned. And by the later generations, like after the Council of Ephesus, and then particularly you mean in the West the or in the East in the, as well? In the East, in the East, in the East. In the, way, the history of the Western Church, it's a different, it's a different matter. Trust me, it's a different. It like it has taken its own development. You see, Christianity is like seed. When you throw a seed. <laughs> You never know what's gonna like what kind of tree it's going like it, it is going to come out like what kind of how many branches it will have or how many leaves it will have or uh, what the colors of the leaves would be. It depends on that because that depends on the ground you saw it on. So the the history of the like Christianity in the West it has taken its own development based on the the, the politics there the culture there all the. Uh, the, the historical incidents that happened, like you can't imagine the Western, uh, for instance, the, the Western uh, Christianity, the Latin Christianity, particularly without Charlemagne, uh, Charles the Great, or, and Charles the Great, what kind of person he was? That's a different, <laughs> that's a different podcast. <laughs> like, we will leave that for another time. Um, but we can say the same thing for the Greeks particularly like the, for the Byzantines and all that, for the Syria, like the Syriac speaking. For the Ethiopian church, we can say the same thing. That seed, that seed called Christianity, that seed called the church. Okay? The, the, the seed of Christianity is not the Bible, it's the church. The church, when it was sown in Ethiopia, it took its own form. It took its own culture. It took its own shape, but it's still a church. The seed is the seed. The seed is the same. It is the cultural, political, historical incidents that, uh, and linguistic differences, uh, the, the that which you will see when you come to a house. You don't see the, uh, you know, all the pillars that have that that hold the, the house up. Rather, when you come, what you see is walls, doors, windows, <laughs> and those things are framed and managed by the practicalities, you know, the practical, the necessities, the practical necessities of uh, a particular context. But the pillars, like, like the basic architectural structure, like the how the the structure how something is supposed to support something like the basic physics that's that remains the same wherever you go unless you so long as you are on the, on the, on the planet earth okay when you go to the moon or somewhere that will be a different story because of the gravity and all that so um the church in ethiopia although theodore of mopsuestia was 
kind of shunned in the later generations by in the East Syrian, uh, in the um, in the Syrians, Syriac speaking churches and Greek speaking churches. The church in Ethiopia has has taken Theodore of Mopsuestia's uh, commentaries. Uh, just in, you know, on this semester, I did one paper on Afrahat from the, the, the Syrian church. And Afrahat is, uh, he lived, he's from the fourth century. He lived, he's a contemporary of St. Ephraim the Syrian. He's West Syriac, right? Um, well, and for now, let, let's not go into that. <laughs> West Syriac, East Syrian. For now, let's let's not go into that. He's he, he's called the Persian sage. It's only later in the I think eighth or ninth century when his name was mentioned as Afrahat, but before that he was known as just the Persian sage. Uh, and Afrahat uh, comes from the fourth century, but later uh, his writings were kind of pushed away by the majority of the churches around uh, like in the in the middle east and northeast africa but you have two of his works translated in Giz. <laughs> so the like the way this so-called schisms were the, the kind of operated in the churches is most of the times through propaganda i can say like there is this propaganda uh, for instance between the greeks and the latins after the crusades particularly after like, it's the crusades which sealed kind of okay from now on we have nothing in common and they just they don't want to do uh, the, like anything with one another after the crusades because the crusades brought them into conflicts and the physical conflict created a problem. Uh, but the Crusades came much, 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 much later than 1054. See, not only that, the 1054 event comes much, much, much later than the cultural and the linguistic differences and the theological expressions that we are growing up in both cultures differently. And unfortunately, they fail to learn about one another. They fail, like they literally fail to learn about one another. The, the, the Latins, especially the Franks, that was the Charlemagne's court. The Franks were very proud of uh, their Frankish origin. <laughs> <laughs> their Frankish originality and uh, so it's, it's they they were proud of themselves and the Greeks also had their own pride you know we are the Greeks like we are the, the civilized Romans <laughs> like, how in the world are we going to go to the Franks and to learn anything about it? <laughs> so that that ethnocentric pride that human pride in the name of Christian piety but it came in the name of Christian piety, in the name of being civilized. We don't have to forget that. They were pious. We are the Orthodox. So right, like, who is going to teach us about anything? That, that kind of mentality is always detrimental to the church. And coming back to the Ethiopian church, the Ethiopian church fathers, the, the great Ethiopian church uh, the, the intellectuals whose name we don't, unfortunately, we don't know because most of them do not write their names on their works. It's, I, in a way, it is, uh, this is good and bad. <laughs> it's great because it shows how humble they were. Like they never left the, the ground or the reason why they were doing all this. And the other uh, thing is how um, unfortunately, the, the 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 sad thing is, like we can't quote them. Like, oh, uh, Merkad Ingel said this, or uh, well, luckily Merkad Ingel, we know a, a couple of his works, or which again back on we know a couple of his works, but most of them we don't know their works, so we can't quote them. And these fathers, however, our fathers, when they went to Jerusalem or to all these pilgrimage sites in the Middle East. Trust me, 
they collected everything they could from the from the churches, whether it's East Syrian church, whether it's uh, the Jacobite church or Melkite or Maronite, they really tried to learn everything they could from everyone they meet. I think that's why we see all these different writers from all the churches in the like in the Ethiopian tradition. And this shows you the magnanimity of the Ethiopian fathers. They didn't, even when we look at the, the, how the Ethiopian church later be, uh, became kind of took a stand against, like, or kind of uh, start, uh, stood against uh, some of the churches, that history comes only later. <laughs> like only later. It has, it, this doesn't mean like the Ethiopian church uh, justifies or ratifies every theological expression that's circulating around. No, no, but it never went at like as far as, as far as I have looked at, into it. We don't see the Ethiopian church excommunicating another church. At least I haven't seen it so far. Probably if there is anything else, somebody will show me. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn because nobody is... Uh, I, I was going to say, um, we were... <clears throat> we were de facto our own thing, as you've described beautifully, but we were de jure under the Abun, under the Coptic bishop, who supposedly is subject to the Coptic synod. And so one could, uh, to play devil's advocate here, say, you know, whatever decisions the Coptic Synod, and if there's any evidence of the Coptic Synod making statements, uh, that would, <laughs> you're, you're the face you're making. <laughs> would that, that has nothing to do with us? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> well, it depends on how you look at the history, you know? Um, look, <laughs> the Ethiopian church, of course, like the, the, the our first, first under quotation, because there are some, some, in, like some indications that there was a bishop in Adulis, like the port of Adulis before Salama, before Abu Salama, Kasati Brand, the first, our first bishop. Uh, so that's why I say, our quote unquote first bishop, Salama, Freminatos, because Freminatos, Abu Salama. Yeah, we know that he was ordained by Saint Athanasius the Great. There is no doubt about that because we have historical evidence. However, that doesn't until until uh, the beginning of the Solomonic dynasty. Like this is after 1270, like the, the 1270 and after that. Until that time, I think it's very, uh, at, le at least we can say, we don't have much evidence to say the Egyptian church governed the Ethiopian church. There is, as far as I'm concerned, hardly any evidence for that. The Ethiopian church was a self-governing church. Of course, the bishops, probably the, the bishops will have, like the, the Ethiopian church had a connection with the Egyptian church. Absolutely, yes. First, it's a neighboring church. Second, Salama was, Abu Salama was ordained uh, by Saint Athanasius and later, also, there was one one deacon called Thomas. Yeah, that that like that tradition of appointing uh, bishops for Ethiopia continued. We know that for at least it didn't cease after Salama. We know that for sure. Like um, who was appointed at certain like at each time. That's that's that needs law like further investigation to know. We have some evidence, especially in the history of the patriarchs of Alexandria. That that volume of three volumes. Yeah, we, we have some evidences there, but uh, yeah, the bishops, they used to, call, like there were ordinations from Egypt, 
yes, but Egypt was not the only player around. We had Syrian bishops. <laughs> uh, like we have evidence from, uh, so I think, 12th 12th century, 12th century, like uh, later written to the 12th or 13th, I think 13th century, sorry, 13th century, uh, where the king writes to uh, the Egyptian patriarch about complaining about two uh, Syrian bishops. It's not even two, it's Syrian bishops. Huh. How how many were they, and like how long were they living in Ethiopia, and what were they doing? We don't know. And look at also all these titles we have in the church: Nebura Id or Akabisat, or all these titles. Usually, the, the head the head abbots of some of the prestigious monasteries and schools of learning. Mm -hmm. What does those titles mean? It's not just title to give you honor. It's not honorary doctorate or something like that. No. <laughs> like these were like the kings were involved. The Ethiopian church was, don't forget, it's a state church. After the fourth century, it's a state church. It's a church of the empire, the Ethiopian Empire. So I'm not I'm not uh, glamorizing this. <laughs> okay. I'm just stating the fact that it was an empire church. It has its own good side, the strong side, it has, it has its own negative sides. Um, so the Ethiopian church, uh, when in the Ethiopian church in history, when somebody is appointed at certain, like at a certain, um, in a certain area, the political structure is involved in that. The kings or the local administration is involved in the appointment of that person. Excuse me. So, these titles were functional. They had administrative power. They were administrative. These are titles that describe administrative power. So, this tells us, okay, the Ethiopian churches a self-governing church. And another funny thing is, <laughs> look, after the seventh century, the Egyptian church herself was at the mercy of the caliphate, the caliphate in Egypt. After the rise of Islam. Exactly. After the rise of Islam, the, the Egyptian church was really at the mercy of the, 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 like the, the uh, Islamic caliphate. And there is even one history, one historical incident where the Ethiopian king and the Nubian king had to come together and kind of start a campaign against the Egyptian caliph to make him release the patriarch of Alexandria, whom he imprisoned, like the caliph imprisoned the patriarch, and the, the Ethiopian king and the Nubian king, they joined their powers and they mar they started marching marching on campaign. Some like there are two ver different versions of the story. One says all the way to the peripheries of Egypt. The other says all the way to Khartoum. So. And the Egyptian uh, caliph was kind of terrified of that. So he said, okay, I'm, I'm releasing this guy. Yeah. The version <laughs> I read, it says that he threatened to dry out the Nile. For those who don't know, uh, <laughs> because they, they view north and south differently, uh, whereas the Mississippi runs from north to south, the Nile River runs from south to north. With the globe going like this, it doesn't matter which way is up and which way is down. And so it seemed possible and plausible to the, the king, or at least the risk did not <laughs> outweigh the cost <laughs> of imprisoning the patriarch. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that was Dawit. I say Dawit. That was Asa Dawit. Uh, uh, yeah, he, uh, he also said something very interesting, uh, <laughs> which was, yeah. It, it might not be good to mention it in public, but 
so they, they, yeah, he he threatened the Egyptian caliph, like because he was the caliph was uh, persecuting the Christians there, and he threatened like unless you stop the persecution of the Christians in your in your vicinity, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna. <laughs> it was it was very interesting. So yeah, the Egyptian church did not really govern the Ethiopian church. No, did it didn't happen. I don't think it happened at all. Of that's course, there good, were bishops coming. That's a good segue because you said there were a lot of nameless fathers. One of the fathers of the Ethiopian church, who I know is close to your heart and who you wrote about, has a name. And yes. uh, he is <laughs> Abba Georgis, or Father George, of Segala or Gasicha. What could you tell us about this man or this place? Frankly, I've never heard of anyone else from Gasicha or Segala. So uh, <laughs> anything you could tell us about where he's from and who he is, that would be great. I, I would love to. He, 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 he's, he's one of my heroes. He, he's, he's one of the giants of the Ethiopian church. I, his eloquence, his intellect, and his and he's a spiritual, like he's a spiritual person. He was a he was a man of prayer. His devotion to the church and his love for the apostolic faith. It's marvelous. Yeah. I, I love talking about the <laughs> And and he, he really benefited the Ethiopian church. He served the Ethiopian church for the last <laughs> six hundred years, six hundred plus years. Uh, I I want to share like the the sa'at that we have like the horologium we have. He is the one who prepared at least the first like the the the, the first part. Let's say like the, the first parts of the sa'at which are more biblical, more uh, liturgical, more into the very in line with the liturgical tradition of the church. The liturgical tradition of like the the, the universal church, he is very much in line with that. Uh, and um, I, yeah, I, I want I want to I want to begin talking about him uh, with with one of his um, beautiful uh, uh, works and beautiful Zema compilations. If you if you you would allow me, please. I, I was gonna I was gonna <laughs> try to lure you as the son of a Maikita or a lead cantor. I was gonna lead you to close with one of his, uh, but yeah, please jump in now too. Okay, uh, I have this horologium. Um, um, let me let me share my screen with you. Do you see my brana? Can you see my uh, brana? No. No, it 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 okay. froze your face on my end. Oh, there it okay. is. It's there okay. now. I can see. It. Now I can see. It. Go ahead. My friend, my 
Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> that was a, a beautiful portion of the hours or the, the orologium, the sa'atat. Yes. And uh, it's uh, in praise of, of our mother, our yes. lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. Yes. So, Abagiorgis, um, he was he was the giant. You know, he was an Ethiopian monk, and he was able to get the best monastic education of his time. His his education, his possible encounter with non-Ethiopian Christians who came to Ethiopia, and his closeness to the royal family seem to have contributed significantly to make him one of the most prolific writers of religious texts in Ethiopia. The genre of his writings span from exegetical theology to hymnody, liturgy of ours, the, the one I just sang from, the, hol the horologium, and multiple Eucharistic prayers or anaphoras. Uh, even though uh, our anaphoras are uh, la labeled as um, uh, Dioscoros, Athanatios. Uh, they commemorate other things. Yeah, they commemorate other saints and other uh, church fathers, but uh, most of them, uh, I, I believe, I, I, I'm, I'm in. The, I, I, I really would like to agree with uh, Professor Gita Chohale on this regard. Like they were written by Bagiorgis. I, I think it's Tressel. Like his his style is all over these these uh, Eucharistic prayers. So Georgis' accomplishments are often compared with Saint Yared of the sixth century or the Ethiopian uh, Roma, uh, Saint Romanus, <laughs> as they had the, the, the Byzantines and the Greek in the Greek tradition they have Saint Romanus from the sixth Romanus was uh, the, me Romanus, the melodist, sixth, the melodist, yeah, Romanus the melodist from the sixth century, and we have Saint Yared the melodist from the sixth century. So sixth century is uh, blessed with hymnodists in the church. You can say so. Abagiorgis is com he can be compared to those those kind of figures. Although Georgis did hardly wrote anything about his biography, like he didn't say much about uh, his biography. The one main reference he gives to himself is Rutu Aymanot. I love that Rutu Aymanot, meaning like orthodox, <laughs> like orthodox according to the apostolic tradition. The correct like, faith, the correct religion. The correct, exactly, the correct faith, the correct glory, the, the correct, the, the correct uh, uh, trusting, if you want. The correct trusting. Haimanot is Haimanuta from Haimanuta. It's, it, it's quite likely it's a Syriac word. Uh, I think it's a loan word in Tugil. It's a Syriac word. And Syriac Haimanuta is uh, faith. And faith, as you know, in the Semitic tradition, it is, it's not... Uh, um, mind like con the consent of mind but something you trust you rely on so he's a rutai manot he's, that's how he describes himself rutai manot. it's your decision making given uncertainty so the trust you make in the face of an uncertain world mm -hmm. yes so he was quite certain in the orthodoxy of his faith and often uncompromising <laughs> some of some of his writings are he, like it, in this way uh in, in this regard i i think i can compare it with um saint Ephraim the syrian i can do Ephraim. i i think i can compare him with him like he is uncompromising against his adversaries <laughs> his, his opponents like or his imaginary opponents uh, they are often as ignorant poisonous satanic <laughs> devilish <laughs> Um, but he's he's not. Um, this is it, it's not like we we can't we we don't have to rush to make anachronistic judgments 
uh, using our uh, sensitivity to uh, linguistic reference uh, of 21st century. You know, we can make that kind of anachronistic judgment. Yes, but I've he heard was very uh, President Tira, Eugenia Constantinou warn her hearers when she invites them to hear the works of St. John Chrysostom, who you mentioned earlier, because mm. of the, the kind of pagan rhetoric tradition that he was trained in before, you know, perfecting his Christian preaching, he uses some of the, the polemic that you're talking about. Each age has its own you know, polemic. There are things about our own age that I'm sure ages past and ages uh, in the future will find to be uh, queer to their age or unusual to them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people will just, oh my goodness, these people are very harsh on the other. Right? No, that, that's how they talk. It doesn't mean that's how they treat one another. <laughs> uh, of course, they are like some... Uh, instance where you see people mistreating one another but that's not like that's not how uh, you're like how these religious writers are uh, treating the other for instance saint john chrysostom you mentioned a good example uh, he says what does it mean to uh, do you remember that in the, in the gospel of matthew the gospel according to matthew sorry the gospel according to Matthew, the Lord says, uh, the Lord Jesus says, you forgive your brother. No, first, uh, you, you, when, you're, when your brother offends you, um, first you go and talk to him. Then you take one brother and uh, talk to him. If he refuses, you bring him to the church. Then if he refuses, then he will be for you like a Gentile and a tax collector, he says, right? And then... Yeah. St. John Chrysostom says, so what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to, to uh, like, he, yeah, that person will be like a Gentile and a tax collector for you. How, do you how, how are you supposed to treat him? And St. John Chrysostom says, how are you supposed to treat a Gentile and a, a tax collector? You love them, you respect them, you give them food when they are hungry, you shelter them when they don't have shelter, you, you give them clothes when they are naked. <laughs> See? Amen. <laughs> that, that, so that's how they interpret it. It doesn't mean they like, it doesn't mean they are they were treating uh, one another like that just, just because they refer to the heretic in a very strong term or that some somebody as when they consider somebody as a heretic they will label they will give him this very uh, strong labels. It doesn't mean they will be they will treat him like that. Um but that doesn't, I'm not, however, I'm not just saying that, oh, our, our fathers were just all holy, like, the, no, the all holy one is just only, only the Lord. Eh? And the <inaudible> Panagia, <inaudible> the Panagia, <inaudible> 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 only the Father yeah. is holy, only the Son is holy, as mm -hmm. only the Holy Spirit is holy, uh, says yeah. our liturgy itself. Yeah, yeah, so. Twice at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You see, the liturgy tells us, like, yeah, all holiness belongs to God. And whomever we we call holy or saint, uh, saint, we are not saying that, oh, everything he did was holy. I don't, like, no. <laughs> I don't think that's what the church is telling us to, <laughs> to consider. Rather, like, there is something holy in this person's life which has benefited the church, which has benefited the generations to come. So we respect that and we have we keep benefiting from that. As as Abba Georgis, for instance, Abba Georgis is a saint for me, doesn't, but it, it doesn't mean uh, all the works and the, 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 all the words and the works of Abba Georgis were holy. No, no, I, I, I don't think he himself would agree with that. I don't think he, he himself would agree with that at all. Because he's, he knows that he's a human being, and he refers him to himself. One of the, the like the frequent references to himself is whenever he refers to himself as Rutuaimanot, he also refers to himself as Hatu Abbasi, a sinner and a trespasser, or exactly. one who commits iniquity. Yes, and the iniquitous one, the erring one, the ignorant one. That's how he refers to himself. So. 
that it doesn't mean we when we say somebody is holy uh, we kind of we have this tendency to make oh everything he did was holy <laughs> no 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 that's only for the lord uh afra had the great afra had the persian sage says in his um demonstration on uh the penitents on the repenting ones or the uh, about nisa about uh, repentance he has one demonstration where he says the the all pure one is only the one <laughs> who is Jesus Christ. That's how he says it. So the, the all pure one is Jesus Christ only. And they, so because they are they, they, like, except Jesus, every, uh, like all our holy fathers, our, our holy mothers, except the Theotokos, except the Theotokos. All our holy mothers, our holy fathers, it doesn't mean that everything they did was holy. Everything they did was uh, perfect. No, they were human beings just like us. So they had their own struggles, they had their own failings, but still, they did great. That's why we are here. They are, that's why we, have, we still have the faith, because they have passed this uh, to us. So... Georgis was uh, strong against his opponents, but Georgis was also a reformer, a, a reformer in the Ethiopian church. Uh, what kind of reformer uh, was he? Uh, well, for, I, I'm, I, I would like to mention one instance where before him, uh, the queens and the kings, when they come to church for the divine liturgy, they used to receive the Holy Communion sitting. They don't stand up with the with the faithful and receive the Holy Communion. No, they would they will just sit there, and the Holy Communion will come to their throne, and they will receive the Holy Communion sitting. And Abba Georgi said, "No, <laughs> no." And he demanded the queen to receive communion standing like everyone else in the church. <laughs> and guess what could happen after that? He could have been put to death. <laughs> yes, that could have happened, but that didn't happen. Instead, the, the queen kind of she said, okay, she didn't she didn't refuse coming to communion um, like everyone else, but she uh, I think was offended by this act because probably it was um, done in public. He did it in public and probably that went straight into her ego. <laughs> so so he, she um, appealed to the king and uh, it was King Dawid. And King Dawid removed uh, Abba Georgis from the royal court and sent him to, to be the administrator, the Nebura'id of Damot. It's a faraway uh, place for that uh, at that time. So he he sent him as uh, the, a new appointee for Damot, the Nebura Ed of Damot. So Georgis lived under the reigns of three kings from the Solomonic dynasty. The last two were his former students. He outlived the two and died during the reign of the third one. Um, so this is. This is uh, his uh, kind of very brief, very uh, short <laughs> biography I, I can give you. Uh, and one of his works is Mas'ahat al Mastir, like, which is some, some people consider it as uh, that's the Summa Theologica of Ethiopia. And as well, Summa Theologica mm, is, you cannot imagine Summa Theologica without Aristotle. But you can imagine Mas'ahat al without Aristotle. <laughs> so Mas'ahat al is even better <laughs> for me. <laughs> it's the same, man. It's got, a, it's got a different mindset. Yeah, because it's, it's the, funny that those, those kind of um, Western Eastern comparisons, you know, I, I had read before people were saying that Rasalula, one of the great Tigrayan aristocrats under Emperor Johannes, is called the the Garibaldi of Ethiopia 
you know they just compare them <laughs> to one of those unifiers of like the italian state like italian people state. <laughs> people people make these comparisons and you know sometimes if the shoe fits put it on but sometimes as you're saying they're they're not quite right yeah just yeah it, it seems to miss a uh, number of things like especially uh i, I like i i admire what uh, St. Thomas Aquinas did in the Latin church. Like, I do admire that. But um, when you, like, t that is not something you can compare with what Abba Georgis did. What Abba Georgis did is he, he just continued that apostolic patristic tradition in the Ethiopian church and he brought it a he gave it into he gave it a new life i think he gave it a new life by his um works particularly mas'af mastir and mas'af sa'atat and arganon arganon is also uh, one of his other uh, uh, other uh, his uh, works which is another beautiful text and the anaphoras right look at them like they are wonderful they are marvelous our anaphoras like you look at kadasi mariam or maza kadasi or uh kadasi johannes holden just look at it how beautiful it is no so yeah bagyorgis is yeah so what was your marvelous. what was the subject of your recent paper that mentioned him and and some of the the schisms that we mentioned before was it? Mm -hmm. I, it sounds I think kind of complexifying the 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 way in which we complexified the schisms in our talk already is this a kind of a in that vein further making it sound more complex than people trying to make it a uh, you know a simple <laughs> this happened at this time at this date you know yeah exactly yes uh, my my research was on Ms. Adam Steer. For for just it's just a, a simple paper, the book of mystery. Would the you call it? Or do you have a, a, do you have a different yeah. translation for mystery? I think it's the book of mystery. You are correct. I, I agree with that. The book of mystery, and the book of mystery is um, it is a compile like it's it it has chapters and it's supposed to be read on certain liturgical days. One of the geniuses of Abba Georgis is. His books are highly liturgical. Even his theological treatise, like his theological works, like Mas'af and Mastir is a theological work. It's a heresiology. It's a refutation of heresies. And Abba Georgis makes sure that this benefits the church. So because he, he, he wanted to be sure that this benefits the church, he puts this um, liturgical rubrics, like when is this chapter supposed to be read? Mm -hmm. This one, read it on the, the, on the Sunday of Brahan. This read on the Sunday of Sibkat. This read it on the night of uh, the, the Holy Pascha. This read it on the Ergat. This, this one, read it on Paraklit. He gives each chapter a liturgical day <laughs> to be read. <laughs> this... This is how he made sure, like, this benefits to my church. Like, he, he's not doing it for, I, I, I argue, like, I really do believe that he was not writing as, um, as many writers would write, like, to, to support their ego or <laughs> somehow to show off their knowledge or something. No, he, like, he wanted to serve the church. He wanted to serve the Ethiopian church. And to make, to make sure that he, he kind of inserted these liturgical rubrics for every chapter. So my paper was, it was, it focused on uh, some of the chapters where he uh, refers to the Council of Chalcedon and <clears throat> what I have found is uh, Abba Georgis's narrative of the Council of Chalcedon is like oversimplistic. 
it's a very simplified, uh, like oversimplified story. And <clears throat> this oversimplified story uh, shows us something, especially when you juxtapose it with the, the, the manuscripts we have from the Aksumite period or the, the few manuscripts, like the, the few written uh, materials we have from the Aksumite period, particularly Mas'ava uh, Kerlos. When you look at it, when you look at Bagyorgis' work, Bagyorgis' very simple, highly oversimplified narrative with of Chalcedon with Mas'ava um, Kerlos, you consider one thing. Like the Council of Chalcedon was not an issue for the Ethiopian Church. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> the Ethiopian Church during like until the 1300s, until the 1200s and the 1300s, particularly we can say after the Solomonic dynasty. It's, this is after the Solomonic dynasty. Before the Solomonic dynasty, the Ethiopian church was not concerned about the Council of Chalcedon. It like, doesn't appear to be. Like, I, I don't think we have uh, much evidence to say that. Because what we have, like the any Christology, like the Christological material, I think we have before the council, the before the Solomonic dynasty is Masava Kerlos, and when you look at Masava Kerlos, what you see is refutation of the so-called Nestorian Christology. We don't have anybody after the Council of Ephesus. Everything stops before the Council of Chalcedon. All the church fathers mentioned there are from the, before the Council of Chalcedon. Having said that, we have to. We have to. I want to remark this thing. However, Masahafek Erlos was like it, it had a, a later addition into it in the 1300s, somewhere around the the 1200s and the 1300s. Some materials which refer to the Council of Chalcedon were added to it. But these were later additions and they were from Arabic. They were translated from Arabic. But the ones we see from the Aksumite period are translations of the patristic works, like different patristic works. It's not just uh, Cyril of Alexandria, no. It, the, there are some other church fathers also. And uh, those uh, patristic works were translated from the Greek. So if you put away the later edition, which came from Arabic, if you put that away, what you see is Masahava Kerlos was concerned only with the so-called Nestorianism, which was rampant, like, which was... Um, highly uh, probably accepted in the Southern Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula, the Southern Arabian Peninsula. So considering the, uh, like the, the kingdom of Aksum or the empire of Aksum's relationship with uh, the, that particular region, it makes total sense if the Ethiopian church was concerned about Nestorianism and Nestorian Christology. But in the meantime, it's very interesting that after that, the Council of Chalcedon and all the the wreck and the, 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 all the, the, the chaos, the political chaos that happened in the um, Byzantine Empire and, all, 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 and also the, the, to some extent the Persian Empire, like the peripheries of the Persian Empire, was none of the concern of the Ethiopian church. <laughs> Almost like we don't see anything. So the Ethiopian church was not concerned. And probably, my guess is, probably this is why Ethiopians, when they go to the, the Middle East for the pilgrimage, 
for uh, that uh, for pilgrimage to Jerusalem and other parts of the that uh, uh, that part of the world, they were not they they didn't feel obliged to to avoid any group. Probably that's why we see all these different writings from like the, the Church of the East and then, then the Jacobites and then the Maron and the Maronites are mentioned to be in communion with the Ethiopian Church according to Georgis of Segla. <laughs> like, what, what do you make of that? Like, <laughs> like if you, you if you just follow the the, the, the like the later uh, face of the Ethiopian church, which came uh, only after 1300s, 40, uh, particularly after the, the 1600s. If you just focus on that, on that image, you will be, I think one will be fooled about the history of the Ethiopian church. The Ethiopian church was an, a self-governing church in communion with the universal church. And it saw itself no greater or no less than the other churches. And it also sees itself, uh, it herself, I think it also saw herself as um, the apostolic church, as a church faithful to the apostolic tradition and the apostolic faith, the apostolic um, deposit of faith. I think that's what we see um, considering all the materials that we have and how much we don't know, like we do, how much we we really like the Ethiopian church did not know. Abagiris, by the way, in Messiah of he doesn't even seem to know um, anything about the uh, how the Western Roman Empire developed and how it, it uh, was separated from the Eastern Roman Empire and how that um, uh, created the, uh, uh, the, the, like the later problem with the Byzantines and between the Latins and the, the Greeks, and also the strife between the Byzantines and uh, the, the Antiochians. <laughs> I, he doesn't seem to know much about that. And why is like, why wouldn't he know about these things? Because it's it was none of his business. Like, he, like the Ethiopian Church didn't care about these things because like, what does it have to do with me? <laughs> they are fighting there. Yeah, they are fighting in Greek, and I don't speak Greek. <laughs> the Greek probably the Greek speaking ancestors have, have passed down by the fifth, sixth century. Like, you don't see any Greek inscriptions. After I don't think we we have any Greek inscriptions in Ethiopia after the after the fourth century, which is funny because we used to have it on our coins. Exactly, we used to have it on our coins. Like even in the third century, we have like the king in Dubis. In Dubis had it, it was written in in um, what is it in in Greek. Uh, and you know that our our fidels are for our uh, numbers. Our numerical system is from Greek, like they, they, these are the Greek letters, uh, kind of given, uh, it's not even the Greek letter, the Phoenician letters, which which was adopted by the Greeks later anyways. So uh, our ancestors, yeah, they, they, they knew Greek. They knew Greek, that's how they, uh, that's how they translated the Bible from Greek as much as they understood, uh, like, like Garima Gospels, it's from Greek, you know, like the civil, like the, the Old Testament um, Bible. It is from Greek. Well, Abagiorgi says something else about the translation of the Ethiopian Bible. He says it was done uh, during from uh, during uh, uh, the the time of the Queen of Sheba and her her sons, like the time of her son and all that. Well, Akidano Likifle has has. Uh, disproved that theory very well i think well we don't have to look for any anybody else like kiran Kifli has done a, a very good job on that uh, and if you don't like if anyone who doesn't trust kiran Kifli, I, I like i would love to refer to them 
as uh, to, uh, to refer to them to compare the Greek. Yeah, we have, I believe the oldest manuscripts we have are from Job and from Daniel, but they could also compare the Psalms, which are very old, various Psalters. Yes, yes. Then they are very like, it's it's visible. Like it's definitely the Septuagint. It's not, it's not the, it's, it's not the Masoretic. <laughs> it's not. It's not the Hebrew. It's not. The well, the Masoretic text wouldn't have even been written. No, 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 no. It wouldn't have even been, been an right. option. Yeah, it, it's not. There was Hebrew available, but it would. It would have been various different Hebrews before the Jews mm -hmm. had canonized their canon at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, the Ethiopian Church was not. Was not concerned. And so, because it was not concerned, it doesn't know. Like, they didn't know. They didn't know about the, the, all the all the, the West, East, uh, Calcedonian. They were not concerned. <laughs> they were not concerned because what does it like? They, they like the people. All the the debate about the Calcedonians and the that the debate was going on in the fifth century, like one operation, one two operations, two wheels, one. All these Greek terminologies, they were difficult to understand, to be understood by the uh, the non-Greek speaking world. So it's only later, even among the Syriac speaking churches, by the way, the schism was, it, 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 it was kind of, it became uh, fully, a comp like comp kind of completed schism only after after Jacob Berdius or Jacob the Elberadi. All these uh, and him and other bishops who used to go around and ordain bishops against the the the, the empire, the Church of the Empire, <laughs> the Church of the Byzantine Empire. That's and, interesting. An, an Indian Jacobite brother asked me about uh, a biography of him recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, he's he's he was a very interesting character. And uh, by the way, <laughs> it is interesting. Uh, today, we uh, like we have, uh, for instance, the Syrian Orthodox. Uh, brothers and sisters in our communion in the, in the Syrian church. Sometimes they refer themselves as uh, Jacobites, or they are referred as Jacobites, right? <laughs> yeah, which is and, funny because there's a totally different political trend of uh, exactly uh, Anglo-Saxon monarchists who have the same <laughs> they use the same title, but they mean different things. I would I would invite them to go back and read what Ephraim wrote about the, the, the so-called heretical groups of his time, like the heretical groups of his time, like fourth century, like the Arians, the, Bar the Bardasanites, the Kukayats, there are, there are plenty of, uh, there were plenty of heretical groups uh, back then. And one of the charges St. Ephraim the Syrian brings is, look, all these groups are named after their founders, <laughs> and some people were referring the Syrian Christians as um, the Paulians, because there was one bishop called Paul. And Ephraim says, "No, we are not Paulians," and he warns uh, his fellow believers not to call themselves as Paulians because. The Bishop Paul would have been offended by this. You are only to be called by the name of Christ and no one else. <laughs> you see, I think that um, Abagiorgis also says the same thing, like almost verb, like word to word, verbat. Says the same thing, like all these groups. He says all the, he mentions all these heretical groups, and <laughs> he says all these groups. They are named after their founders, he says. But the Ethiopian church is not named after anybody. <laughs> we are not named after anybody. We are named after Christ, period. That's how it is. And, and does he refer to, does he say, 
the Ethiopia Beta Christian, he says the Ethiopian church. Is that one of his phrases or how does he refer to it? I, I know the whole formalization of Tawahedo as the title doesn't come till centuries later. So it's always interesting to me. Yeah. I first began thinking of this when I was reading about Abbas Tifanos and, and the Stephanites, the way I think he would refer is on detork Adis. He would either say the one church or the holy church. Is, is there a way in which mm -hmm. Abba mm -hmm. Georgis self refers to the, the church? Yes. For Abba Georgis, it's just Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the country is the church. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Ethiopia and he don't look that like we, he, here. Like, um, let me let me look into if if I, if I can find it. Uh, I, I would love I would love to. Like, like, he he refers to the church as like, for him. Okay, let me put it this way. For him, there is no church and state. Uh, two different apparatus, apparatai. No, there is just one society of God, period. And in that society of God, there are administrators called kings, and there are church leaders called bishops and priests and deacons and all that. So the way he sees the, the, Ethio the, the Ethiopian church, is he refers to the Ethiopian churches as Ethiopia <laughs> or his Ethiopia or yeah or generally like Ethiopia Ethiopia husb or Ethiopia just generally Ethiopia and the like Ethiopia <laughs> yeah that's beautiful. I I think um, this has been great in terms of getting people to begin to chew on some of these ideas and concepts, whether it's Ethiopians who want to pursue learning guz so that they can begin to grapple with these manuscripts the way that you do, or whether it's non-Ethiopians who want to begin learning more about the Ethiopian church or the church in Ethiopia, are there any introductory books or essays or articles that you would point them to or any kind of final uh, advice that, that you would have? Ooh. <laughs> you see, uh, in the Ethiopian tradition, a student is not asked advice. A student can only be asked what he has learned and what he has not, what he has understood and what he has not. <laughs> Advice is reserved for the elders, the knowing ones, the wise ones, awaki. Tamahari. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, she was referring, it was, my name is a kind of, yeah, my name is usually not referred as in, in its fullness, unfortunately, because it gets too long. Uh, my, when you hear the word Mahari, you are not supposed to hear it just to hear just the word. No, you are supposed to hear Xiab here Mahari no. Okay, <laughs> that's that's how you are supposed to hear it. Amen. The Lord, the Lord <laughs> is a merciful one. The Lord uh -huh. is a teacher. Yeah. So uh, I I can't give you advice, but I can tell you what I have learned. Like the first thing is. We have to learn from our fathers to be open, to be open to learn the, the diverse traditions of the apostolic church. That church has grown in different parts of the world, having different colors and features. We have, to, like, we, I think we need to be, we need our eyes to be open. in fraternal charity. 
That's the first thing. And second, I think we need to study the patristic tradition of the church. What has been handed down to us? Not just the materials that we have, as wonderful as they are, as lovely as they are, as our as holy as they are, our fathers. Okay. Without like, the, the, I'm not withstanding that. I would like, but yeah, we we have to. We respect that. We cherish that. We 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 study that. However. We don't study them just by themselves because they did not live by themselves. Even though the Ethiopian church lived and governed herself, she lived in communion with the other churches in the world. And communion at different levels, at different historical periods. So we can't, I think we can't box the Ethiopian church in this, into this little teeny tiny corner where uh, the, we don't want to learn about anybody else and nobody nobody else uh, know, knows what the Ethiopian church can contribute. Like, we, we can't reduce the church into that position in our generation. Like it will be uh, trampling upon the tradition we have received. The universal, like the Ethiopian church was part and parcel of the universal church. And as because we are, because the Ethiopian church is part and parcel of the universal church, one of the things we need to learn is we also have a responsibility of leadership in the universal church. We can't expect everything to be done by other churches, by Alexandria or Antioch or Jerusalem or Rome or Constantinople. We can't do that. And often, even, even these seas, these ancient apostolic seas, except Constantinople, <laughs> for, my, for my own reason, well, later it's considered as the, the, the it's given to our apostle, the apostle Andrew, but. That's another issue. Um, when these people are fighting, what should be our responsibility? Reconciliation. Okay. We we should be like the Ethiopian Church. I believe that have a huge responsibility because it it was a church that was free from state persecution for a long time. And this is a society, this is a church that was a church of the empire before everyone else. And I can argue that including the Armenians. <laughs> <laughs> I know my Armenian brothers and sisters might be, no, we are the first. I think the Ethiopian church was the first church of the empire, empire imperial church. Um, however, it doesn't matter who is, who is the first, who is the second. It just doesn't matter. Competition. Competition has violence in it, and I, I, I didn't mean Certainly that. the longest lasting until 1974. Exactly. <laughs> the longest lasting. So we have a responsibility first to, in the, in the ecumenical movement, to bring all the churches together into, the, in, into that Eucharistic gathering. That's the first thing. Uh, the second is we have... The second, when I say the second, it doesn't mean like uh, the kind of secondary. No, just <laughs> because I can't say first, first. I can say I have to say first and second. The second is we have to go out into Africa. We have to go into Somalia. We need to go. We need to translate the Bible into Somali. Amen. We need to translate the Bible into Afar, into the, we need to translate the, the divine liturgy as we recently did it into Afan Romo. We need to do it into all the possible languages where the church is functioning. And we need to go out. You know, we I think we need to learn from our fathers. They come together around the Eucharist. Then they went out 
to Eucharistize the society. And they, like, by be, Eucharistizing the society, by churchifying the society, they made the society into a big, giant church where people live under, united under God. Okay, not united under a political uh, <laughs> economy. Nothing wrong, and I, I'm not saying like people shouldn't unite against political economy. If they could do it, great. But that's none of my concern <laughs> because that cannot be a true union quint quintessentially. The city state is always built on fratricide. We can go through history and just prove that. I don't want to go into that for now. We can go into that in another podcast. So we need to learn from our fathers. We have we have gathered around the Eucharist. Great, wonderful. When the deacon says, don't go to your home and sleep. <laughs> go out. Go out and bring people back into the fold of the in, into the fold of the Trinity into the arms of the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our Trinitarian way of life. This is our Trinitarian uh, the, uh, the life of joy and happiness and peace and tranquility. You see, we need to go and engage in that life, in that kind of life. Like go out and let the life that you have received into the world, let it out. Okay, let the light go into the world and be light to the world. And I think these are the two things and uh, uh, I would like, to, I would love to suggest. Uh, and the second thing, the, the third thing will be books and books. There are plenty of books <laughs> written about the Ethiopian church, the Ethiopian, the history of the Ethiopia. Uh, but hmm, for for especially for uh, ministers in the church, I would really would like to suggest that they need to study the patristic tradition. Just read, please. Uh, honestly, sometimes I I, uh, I, I'm, I I don't follow most of what goes on in the social media, but what I see embarrasses me. After sometimes, like even the like sometimes it embarrasses me like. In the name of preaching, like some people make these very blatant arguments, which really go in, in contradiction with um, the, the 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 deposit of the faith, what the church has uh, handed out, handed down to uh, from generation to generation. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll the first two uh, suggestions. I think people get overwhelmed by the amount of options. If there was one book for introduction, where would you point them? One book. Hmm. Obviously, they can go and read a million books, and you want them to read a million books. But if you, if <laughs> is there one that you could just get everyone to begin with that would hopefully, you know, make them more excited and hungry and thirsty to read and consume more books? As we see the great apostle John consuming the book from the angel or the scroll in Revelation uh, chapter ten, and and he's in the tradition of Ezekiel doing it in in the scroll of Ezekiel chapter one. Yeah, um, I think I will. I I would love to suggest to two of uh, uh, the the giant two of the giants of Ethiopian history, Tadaset Amrat and Sir Gohablis Lassi. Those could be a good start. It doesn't mean they are perfect. It doesn't mean everything like everything is done and complete and perfect. No. It's just an academic work, but they serve great, like a, a great introduction. So I reviewed Tadesta Tamarat's book. It's called Church and State on this channel, yes. and it's from 1270 AD to the 1500s, right before yes. dual invasions from the east and from the south. Uh, I, I forget the name of Sirgo Habrasalase's book, but I, I believe it's the period before that, right? The Aksumite period? Yes. Yes, it's the Aksumite period until 1270. Church and state in Ethiopia, I think. Church and state in Ethiopia until 1270. I think that's the title. If oh, correct. wow. Similar titles for both books. Yeah, and they were, and these were colleagues. We don't have to forget that. 
Sargabla Selassie and Tadezat Amrat were colleagues. They're from the same generation, they used to teach at the same department. And if I'm, I remember correctly, even uh, uh, Dr. Sergo, uh, Sergo Habla Selassie even uh, thanks Tadezat Amrat, I think, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I found the title. His is called Ancient and Medieval Ethiopian okay. History to 12 yes. Steps. Yes, yes, correct. Ancient and Medieval, yes. Ancient and Medieval Ethiopian History. Very similar yes. titles, but yeah, yeah, they worked together. They had a yeah. cabal or a cadre of, of sorts, uh, but not, <laughs> not of the communist variety, but of the Ethiopianist yeah. variety, uh, yeah. along with uh, a lot of the other greats of the 20th century. Well, thank thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me for your marvelous on. for your marvelous program. I I talked a lot and it's full of digressions. Even though we were thinking about yeah, maybe 30 minutes or something. <laughs> like we went on and never, on. Never leave it. <laughs> digressions, um, yeah, digressions. Digressions are interesting because they bring so much. Like there is so much to do. Honestly, there is so much to do in the church. Especially I in think all of the greatest innovations in science have been digressions. The one they famously teach us about in grade school is penicillin. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not. Um, I can't say much on that. Sorry, <laughs> that's above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, someone was doing experiments elsewhere, and through molded bread, they found something that has become a basic instrument of healing for us now. And uh, no one would have thought to look in molded bread. You know, molded <laughs> bread is a digression of sorts, but in this case, it turned out for the better. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for your time. Thank you again, Hino Noke, Xavier Stellin, to invite for inviting me to your uh, great program. I know you I have I have already told you uh, in person, like you're 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 doing a marvelous job and I hope the Lord will strengthen you and uh, keep your keep you in service for the good of the church and for your own salvation too. <laughs>